Well, hello, everyone. I'm Doug Bradford, president of Mount Vernon. I'm joined here with my friend and colleague, Chris Pearl, professor at Lycoming College, and we are honored to be part of the National Archives book series. And today we're going to talk about our new book, From Independence to the U.S. Constitution, as part of the Constitution Day celebrations in the National Archives, a very important day. And also, I just want to thank the audience for being here with us together. Uh, I, I'm dialed in on this call from Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's home and estate here right on the Potomac. Chris, where are you uh, calling in from? Calling in from Williamsport, Pennsylvania at Lycoming College. Is there anybody you want to give a shout out to there at Lycoming? Yeah, I want to give a shout out to the Humanities Research Center who's live stream streaming this right now. Excellent with students, so they're eating pizza, hopefully Lovely. enjoying themselves. Fantastic. So uh, the book is called From Independence to the U.S. Constitution, Reconsidering the Critical Period of American History. So I thought, Chris, we could talk a little bit about the critical period, uh, what it is and, and why we're interested in it. And so when historians say something like the critical period in the U.S. history, what are, what are they referring to? Really, mostly they're referring, referring to the 1780s and this feeling of crisis. And there's this sort of inevitability when they use critical period that that crisis ends up with the sort of ratification of the U.S. Constitution. So there's like a thorough line right through the 1780s. So the 1780s is sort of like precursor to the Constitution. Yeah, so historians uh, are always trying to do shorthand to understand the past, right? I mean, we... Yeah. We talk about the 1960s and that conjures images of uh, reform movements. And uh, we talk about the 1940s and decades. And the critical period is, is a term that we've used for a very long time. Uh, I mean, it was coined by other people, but a lot of people associated with the historian uh, John Fisk. And you've written a little bit about who Fisk is uh, in our introduction to this yep. volume. Uh, who, who is John Fisk, Chris, and why did he come up with this title? So uh, John Fisk actually, uh, he wrote this book in 1888, The Critical Period of American History. And uh, he's not a historian, he's a philosopher. And I like some of the think of you as a philosopher as well. Yes. <laughs> but uh, he is traveling around and he's uh, lecturing at a series of universities in the United States. Uh, and in England, and he's um, really caught up in um, the works of Darwin uh, in particular. And so he's constantly looking for this sort of natural progression of man and where it happens. And uh, a lot of the work in, in history, it's, it's making it seem that that's taking place in Europe. And so Fisk wants to make that a key theme for America. So no, the natural progression of man happens in America. And he sort of outlines this in one of his, I think his uh, favorite works for him himself. Um, it's I think it's outlines of cosmic philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Right, which he uses the sort of ideas there in uh, the critical period. And so the critical period is it shows America going through stages. It has um, America's in anarchy, and then there is this moment of sort of like cultural transformation and civilization through the heroic labors of the founders who saved this sort of disjointed republic on the brink of collapse um, with the Constitution itself. And so it's this, this story of progress. And uh, he's not the first person to coin the term critical period. Uh, I think that's Trescott uh, was many years earlier, but he's certainly one who popularized it. And we have to realize just how significant Fisk's work was um, at the time. So when it was published in 1888, uh, the Journal of Education picked up on it. And they made it oh, from from 1888 to about 1941. Um, that journal was publishing uh, Fisk as uh, the third most important book for teachers to read, be behind only Shakespeare and Addison. Yeah, right. that's that's pretty remarkable to think of. You know, uh, a book today that really only historians know anything about, and and many of them don't. That it was so popular, so influential on the way Americans were thinking about their own history. Of course, the context there is Fisk had lived through the American Civil War. Right. And he, despite that, would argue that the 1780s was the most important decade in American history. You know, I mean, that's kind of remarkable. 
when you think about it, because it's sort of an afterthought. You have the American Revolution, of course, 1776, and that ends in 83, the war. And then you've got the Constitution and the, and the first presidency. And Fisk was saying this in-between time uh, was actually more important than anything that had happened. And he was particularly interested uh, in, in emphasizing why the United States didn't have what he called a European outcome, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, Europe was constantly at war with each other and these petty states were fighting uh, and fighting. And, and how, did, how did it come to pass that the United States didn't just dissolve into multiple small states? Um, ironic in a sense, since he's writing post-Civil War. Post -Civil but, War. But, exactly. but, a, but a Civil War that was won by the North and the Constitution amended and so it was really seen as a continuity rather than a break, uh, you know, from his point of view. But so, uh, so should we talk a little about uh, why we wrote this book and what we want to contribute to Fisk here? Yeah, yeah, I think um, it started at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington in 2014. I was only a participant um at that time i hadn't been brought in as a we as an editor of a volume yet uh that was your brainchild with brian murphy if i'm correct right um, yeah so, there's a lot of us who've been talking about it and brian was critical there he was critical for the critical period yeah yeah uh, but yeah we why don't we pull up the the slide uh that i provided there's two slides uh if we could just pull those up on the screen and share them i'll tell you a little tale so this is um the reading room of the Washington Library, George Washington's own presidential library at Mount Vernon. Uh, and it was brand new in 2013. Uh, and, and in it, you see a lot of libraries have these busts, this collection of worthies. And our worthies there, obviously, at Mount Vernon, uh, where our mission is to teach about the legacies of George Washington. In, the, in his own library here, you have busts going around. You got Franklin. Uh, Hamilton, and then the first four presidents of the United States, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and, and uh, James Madison. And if you go to the next slide, you can see them a little bit better. Uh, we advance the slide one. Yeah. So these are the busts before they were installed in the library itself, so you can get a, a close-up look. And, and one of the things is, as I was the first director of that library when it opened up, and so I was confronted with these gentlemen all the time. I'd go into the reading room and they'd be staring at me, glowering at me. If you look at their expressions here, uh, you know, I know that Chris tries to emulate this look of Madison and, <laughs> when he's teaching classes. Uh, you kind of look like uh, Madison there. Uh, Chris, you could do your hair like that. You look like Eddie Munster, I think. But, uh, I don't know if your students know who that is, but they can Google him. Uh, anyway, so... But what's interesting about these busts from my from the conversation about the critical period, and it does speak to, I think, one of the themes we, we push through the volume, is that uh, these guys are all depicted as they looked in 1785. So George Washington, right in the middle there, the reason that is, it was sort of serendipitous, there's a famous bust of Washington done by Jean-Antoine Boudin, a great French sculptor who came all the way across the Atlantic to take the likeness of George Washington, who at that point was one of the most famous men in the Eurocentric world. Uh, and that bust was always considered by his family to be the finest likeness of the man. And so our sculptor at Mount Vernon, uh, Studio Ice in Brooklyn, did these, uh, same person that did the, uh, the Constitution Center, if anybody's seen that collection of busts there. But it started with Washington and then said, well, why don't we make these other founders that we were going to put in the library, we'll make them how they would have looked in 1785. So all of these founders we think of as sort of timeless and sort of out of time in a way, um, you know, Jefferson and, and Franklin, they're depicted as they looked in 1785, as, as good as you could do. Uh, and so the question came to my mind, well, okay, what does this mean that we have busts of the founders sort of before the Constitution, but after the War for Independence? And it is in that moment, um, you know, and just like us, uh, these guys, if they were in a room together, which they never were all together in 1785, but if they were, you know, they would have no idea what was coming uh, two years down the road, one year down the road, five years down the road. And just like us today, we have no idea what's going to happen in two years or five years or 10 years. And, and certainly that comes even more to the fore as people who lived through and are living through a pandemic. 
And so that, that I think, is one of the spirit of the idea of taking a look at Fisk again in this book, is we ask authors to really try to forget uh, that the Constitution happens uh, in 1789 and look at the years after independence uh, in its own right, but also kind of take attention to what are, what are some continuities from pre-revolutionary colonial America? So what are some of the things that were happening in the 1760s that are continuing in the 1780s? And then also sort of take that long view as a way to get away from uh, the judgment that we put on it, that Fisk himself puts on the moment of the 1780s, because Fisk is, of course, everything's leading up to the Constitution. That's, uh, that's the thing that saves the country. Uh, and that becomes kind of a political football. We could take the slide away now, uh, Pearl. Doesn't it become a bit of a, uh, a fight? You know, progressive historians or Fisk-minded historians, you know, use the 1780s to argue about the nature of America in a fundamental way. Yeah, they do. And, and, and then we kind of lose through that, right, the 1780s yeah. itself. Yeah. And what, it so what, for instance, would like a Beardian or a neo-progressive pr approach to the 1780s? Me. So Fisk made it about the heroic action of the founders to right. save the country from anarchy, which results in the Constitution, which thank you, National Archives, for protecting the original Constitution. Everybody should be encouraged to go there, in addition to all your incredible archival work. But so that's the Fisk view, that it's sort of the founders are these heroic figures. The Constitution is the result of their heroic action, saves the country from a European outcome. What would a critique of that from the, the more of a kind of a left or progressive approach be, Chris? Well, the, it, it's not heroic that it's self-interested, right? And that this was about sort of taking away from the democratic tendencies of 1776 for um, elites to take power, control, and to make money, right? So fueling their own self-interest. And so it's sort of like, these elite interest groups controlling and the narrative and then controlling the politics thereafter through the constitution. And which is a continuation of some of the work that had been done in the early 19th century already. Um, so I'm thinking Beard is really a continuation of some of the early 19th century, particularly um, that came out of uh, William Lloyd Garrison, seeing the constitution as a corrupt bargain with the slave. Yeah. Right. right. So then you have Beard, that brings in this sort of self-interested aspect of the 1780s that leads to the constitution. So it's not heroic at all. Um, and they're questioning the very nature, in, in essence, questioning the very nature of a critical period, mm -hmm. right? Um, is this a figment of their imagine of the founders, as we just saw those busts, imagination yeah. uh, to achieve their own ends, right. essentially. And we have, for the most part, really um, in the literature fought over that. Uh, what was critical about the critical period and for whom and why, right? Or is it even useful? Uh, what I found really, um, I, don't, I don't know if I could jump in with this. Yeah, really yeah, yeah. Let's get into so, that. I mean, you asked these questions in 2014, like we need to think about the 1780s on its own terms, right? And, and think about it as continuities from the 1760s. Like they're still wrestling with problems of the colonial period, which is really significant, right? So they're there and they're trying to problem solve. And they're not necessarily they don't know what's what's coming in the future and that's you know on its own is, is significant but then when we sat down to frame the volume yeah right like so this was 2014 and then then you and i sat down i think in the summer of 2020 to frame this thing and sort of think about what the implications of of what we have here okay. um, i don't know it became more relevant to me mm. right like the, yeah it, it, they saw something as critical because of this, you know, because of finances be, for a host of issues that we can get into. And we were living through something, and we still are, that you perhaps could be considered critical, or maybe 50 years from now will be considered critical, yeah. right? But we well, don't know if it will be, because yeah. it's only critical for what comes after, like what's yeah. accomplished. Well, I mean, that's true in part. I mean, you know, you, so for instance, if you read one of the blurbs on our book, John Brook, we both yeah. greatly admire, yeah. the question of how critical the decade of 1780 was for whom and why has been foundational. And this book is assembled in a fascinating important set of essays that reframe the problem 
for a new generation living in its own time of crisis. Yeah. Right? So there's an assumption by Brooke that we are in a, our own crisis period or that, you know, and you see it in, it was reported out in the introduction, you see it in opinion polls, you know, the, the percentage of people who think the country's on the wrong track is massive. The percentage of people who distrust the institutions that have governed America from the, obviously the, the presidency, the Congress, the Supreme Court, but also the media, the universities, the uh, even even the military is at, a, is at a low ebb. And so there's a sense of uh, disillusionment. Right. Uh, there is a sense of crisis in democracy, as we, we hear about all the time from both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, and so that, you know, I, and that may be why you felt viscerally that, viscerally that uh, you know, that this was more relevant uh, as you entered to, in, in, when we look back at this work uh, in 2020. Right. And so what does critical mean? Yeah, we can say crisis, but it's critical for Fisk and others because it ends with the, the sort yeah. of constitution. So and we're living through this moment. So what do we end with? Right is is sort of the question that I was I was sitting there over looking at this. Uh, it became super relevant, right? and and that's when we started writing it up and and framing it in an introduction. Um, yeah. really made me think differently um, about the 1780s in a way, or maybe. Um, the, well, yeah, I mean, well, it, and we assembled an incredible collection of essays by a bunch of great historians, and uh, you know, maybe we should just go through a few of them and talk a little bit about you know, how they contribute to this question. Um, you know, what, what we might have a takeaway as we get toward the end of our conversation, you know, for, for everyone. Uh, but you, you know, we kick off the volume with that introduction that frames the historiography like we've talked about. It frames the moment we're in. A moment, you know, which in, in many ways was practically relevant because you had, you know, you had a federal authorities being ignored by state authorities. Yep. They were going their own way you know, who were rejecting advice from the CDC or they were rejecting advice from the White House or the states felt like they were going it alone in some cases. You had localities uh, opposing the states with mandates about masking or distancing or opening restaurants and, and people uh, opposing that. You had uh, protest stations in the streets over the murder of George Floyd and racial justice. You had an explosion, therefore, of sort of grassroots democratic action uh, yeah, and all crisis. those all those things happen in the 1780s, right? I mean, those are all things we see in in the post uh, independence moment in, in the United States, right? And I and I think what the the volume does really nicely, besides take the 1780s on its own terms, is um, instead of focusing on just problems, the problems were always there, but this idea of possibilities mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, yeah. and, and if you take all, I mean, every one of the essays is all about this. There's problems, there's, but there needs to be problem solving. And there was problem solving. And they, you know, conjured these ideas of possibilities. Um, so well, I think, let's, let's, start, let's start with your piece, actually, as you talk about that, because your piece really is about trying to solve problems yeah. at, the, at the local level. And we think about, you know, and there's, there's a long tradition, obviously, of foregrounding the national story in American history. So the Constitution is a major point, obviously, but there's a lot of very anachronistic thinking about how that federal government worked in that that the early period, as opposed to how it works today. Uh, and, and you, of course, are focusing particularly on the states and what what they were doing. Talk a little bit about about your essay and uh, where it came from and what, what you're trying to say. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so. That's is titled such a spirit of innovation that such a spirit of innovation. Yeah. Uh, the and American that, Revolution, the creation of the states. Yes. <laughs> and it, it that quote is from um, a Massachusetts, he's a Harvard professor and he's writing to John Adams in May 15, 1776. And he's sort of hysterical because um, it seems like everything's going to change in Massachusetts itself, in the state. They want assemblies, they want town, you know, new town structures and institutions and et cetera. And so there's this outpouring of innovation in 1776, um, but it's all rooted in the problems of the colonial past mm -hmm. and how to solve the problems of the colonial past, particularly the problems of governance. Right. right. So give me, give me one good example of, of a problem that they're trying to solve and that you see as a broadly a broadly shared problem across different states. Um, sure, it's sort of a, 
interconnected problem, and, it, and it's a lot has a lot to do with the judiciary and mm -hmm. the appointment of officials. And so the appointment of officials is is um, basically a small cluster of people can have access to that political and legal power. Um, and they're living far away from the population at large. They're not really interested in the the day to day activities of governance. Um, and this is creating problems as the the population grows in this in the 1760s of well 50s 60s into the 70s uh, as the as the as the states become more geographically expansive as their economies change they can become more complex and so people are looking to governing institutions to help you know order their lives in something that seems to be changing daily. Uh, yep. And it just it, it's it can't happen in the political system of the colonial period. So in 76 and in the state constitutions and the tinkering with it in the 1780s, um, they're trying to fix all of those problems. Um, so in the essay, I focus on New Hampshire, Virginia and Pennsylvania and their attempts to create um, a state government and really centralize power um, in the judiciary itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have like a sort of ad hoc disjointed feel to governance yeah. that it, it has state laws it has uniform practices and procedures clear separation of powers uh, but that's happening in the 1780s and also to make those governments more representative of the population yeah. so so when you look at and when you focus on the angle of view of what's happening in the state level how does that change our thinking about say the meaning of the American Revolution or its radicalism or not radicalism, uh, you know, how does it help us see a picture uh, of people in action differently than if we focus on the national? Sure. Um, I, I think that, one, we see a sort of standard story of a democratic deficit, right, in the 1760s, 70s that is influencing people and mobilizing them to support um, the revolution and independence and new state governments. Um, but we also see a le legitimization crisis or a legitimacy crisis in um, the 1760s and 70s. These governments are slowly becoming, and then pretty rapidly in the 1770s, obsolete. You know, they are viewed as unjust and, and archaic and corrupt. And so there is a problem of legitimacy in the 1760s that's playing out in the 1770s and they're trying to create new governments to have sort of legitimate sovereign power um, that people will recognize. And one of the things that I point out by looking at the states in the 1780s, it helps us understand the critical period a little bit more um, because you, you can't expect new governments without habits of habits of allegiance and obedience and opinion to just function seamlessly overnight there's there's going to be trial and error there's going to be problems associated with allegiance and and a host of other issues that they're going to have to work out there's a lot of unintended consequences in what they create in say 1776 in a constitution that will need to be worked out so one of the things i point out is there is that um, it might seem like a crisis, but the crisis owes its, itself to the sheer sort of innovation of the period and change. Yeah. Yeah. And it needed time, circumspection, uh, to work in circumspection to work out. Yeah, that, that's a really telling point. And I think the broader point you make, which is really uh, compelling, is the idea that we see rebellion uh, in this period in the 1780s, like the Chases and others. Uh, we see these uh, these opposition or populist movements, and they're really clamoring for better government, for good government. Yeah. They're not anti-government no. movements and protests. So, uh, which is a which is sometimes I think forgotten. Now, of course, in the 1780s, so we wouldn't call these democratic from a 21st century no. point of view. Absolutely they don't not. include women as full political participants. They tend to exclude people based in some cases on religion, in some cases explicitly on race. And of yes. course, slavery is one of the important uh, uh, questions of the American Revolution is, you know, what does it do for slavery? How does it change it? A lot of historians uh, who are critical of the Constitution and the compromises that are at play there, you know, claim that the Constitution is itself a pro-slavery document, again, kind of mirroring the language of uh, William Lloyd Garrison and some of the absolute, absolutist abolitionists of the 1830s as a you know compact with the devil 
Uh, now, uh, we have an essay in here which takes a little bit of issue with that uh, framing. And can you talk a little about uh, about Nick Wood's piece and what he's going after in the book? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, Nick, was, uh, Nick Wood's essay is, is, is excellent. It's, it's called Abolitionist Congress and the Atlantic Slave Trade Before and After Ratification. And so, again, there, there's that through line of the 1780s into the Constitution. But I like it. It's sort of before and after that ratification. And we can see a great deal of continuity. And what strikes me with yeah. um, in, in Wood's essay is that um, <clears throat> abolitionists that he's writing about um, in the 1780s and into the 1790s and even later, um, but particularly in the 1780s, saw a real problem with getting any anti-slavery bills or agendas passed in the states because of the Articles of Confederation. Mm -hmm. And they, and, and they were, with the Constitution, when there's sort of a proposed Constitution, an idea of a new Constitution to alter the Articles of Confederation, actually latched onto that and saw possibilities. And what's really significant, they still saw possibilities, though limited, even after the ratification. So they're they're yeah. still in the debates in 1790 and especially in 1794, right? So they don't instantly yeah. see the Constitution and the end of their ability to affect change. And I thought that that was a really significant way to look at it. And he did all of this through the slave trade. Yeah, so it, it's, you can criticize the Constitution and obviously the country that um, that emerges in the 19th century, particularly the expansionist, you mm -hmm. know, pro-slavery nation of like the 1840s. Yeah, um, that is an inevitable in the in the, in the 1790s from the perspective of, of of Woods' argument on this and uh, and recognizing that things like the fugitive slave laws that were passed in the 1790s are really coming continuations of what have been going on under the articles but what's innovative is actually the laws that are limiting the slave trade that have limited slavery uh, that have give, gives a forum and a possibility of of, uh, of the, the limitation uh, of that trade so it, it is you know it's complex like the revolution itself in which there's advances uh, mm -hmm. in freedom and there's also uh, uh, possibilities for back treading as well. So what does that mean? I mean, how, how does that help us think about, you know, the story of the continuity of slavery or abolitionism in American history? How would you, for instance, teach it differently or, or with nuance? Uh, well, I think, I think we can see, <clears throat> one, you don't want to say that this is like pure optimism. And I think would... Right is really is really good at showing that yeah there's there's optimism there but it's it's extreme it's limited and practical right it's, um, yeah. but what you can also do is say that the constitution is is not something that's sort of um set in stone that slavery will exist and will continue to exist that there is still possibilities there for change um and, and it's immediately reinterpreted it's reinterpreted constantly right it isn't like all of a sudden the, the character of American democracy is defined in, in 1789. Yeah. And that, that speaks also to, you know, this question of the, the promises of the democratic spirit of 76. Yeah. I mean, those promises aren't shut off because the constitution is ratified. They just, they take shape in different ways. The practicalities emerge in different ways. I mean, the Jeffersonian rise of that movement is going to happen later in the 1790s. It's, you know, it's, Right, uh, you know, and I think that that sort of progressive versus Piskian fight over the meaning of the critical period, uh, we're really in this book. You're really seeing it as uh, well turning down the volume, right, on on uh, the meaning of one specific moment, the passage of one law. The, the, you know that this is a, an ongoing uh, characterization of, of dealing with problems and how they're dealt with. Yeah, and, and I think you can also, I mean, if you're teaching like a survey course, right, um, you can see how the Constitution is a solution to some problems. And that's something that comes up in all of these essays, yeah. is, is a solution to some problems. It has intended and unintended consequences. It doesn't right. solve every, anything, or not, not anything, but everything. And then you can also, therefore, chart, if you're in a survey, you know, what happens next. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. There's not there's not a, it's an inevitability after that. There's still this sort of optimism, but there's still yeah. problems that they're faced in 1760 that they're facing in 1830 and 1840.
Right. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the I think that's one of the things that comes out of the volume is that this is an era of practical efforts by a lot of different types of people to reshape, redefine the political possibilities of the revolution in their moment. But they're also dealing with, you know, movements and tendencies that are beyond their immediate grasp and control. And, and so um, I think we, we need to approach uh, with humility. Our own moment as well. I mean, you know, if this is a crisis we're in, and, you know, in 2022, the United States, we, we, we might need to be a little more humble about knowing exactly what's right and wrong uh, as, we, as, we find, as we find we disagree on a lot of, a lot of issues in this country. Mm-hmm. One of the, it's kind of reminds me one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that one of the problems of the 1780s was the sort of lack of a national character, huh. national identity, right? Um, and for some people that was a that was a problem, but that also posed in solving them possibilities. And I, and I think your essay speaks to that really nicely yeah. about uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon during the critical period. So can you sort of speak to that? Like, yeah, thanks. Uh, Mount Vernon. Well, Critical period. Yeah, well, I mean, as you know, I've been interested in the problem of national identity in the 18th century context for a long time. And, uh, you know, there's this old, old essay now when people talk about nationalism. Benedict Anderson had written about imagined communities, and he's really talking about, you know, the, the, the kind of magic of national belonging is that you can imagine yourself to share something with people that you'll never meet, you know, with millions of people. Uh, and, and Anderson makes an argument about how print culture and the, and the emergence of widespread print culture in, the, in early modern Europe and other places allows individuals to imagine themselves, you know, you know, because you, know, you grow up in a world where you, you know, your family and your members of the same town or village, you don't travel anywhere, but you can imagine yourself as part of this, as part of our community. And, and, and that literature has evolved over the years. But what is interesting about the American Revolution, of course, is that uh, it is a national independence movement that's fought by a bunch of uh, colonies that aren't a nation. They're not a national people. They're not defining themselves as a national people before they're declaring their independence. And even in their declaration, they're really talking about these united colonies are and ought to be free and independent states. They're not saying we, the people of the United of, of America, are you know aggrieved and, and movement now there's lots of rhetoric in there that sort of proto nationalism or whatever and so the question then becomes you know many historians say well there is no nation america is not a nation and that has to develop over you know the next 200 years and some people would still say we struggle defining you know the essence um but the reality is in, in the post-independence period in the United States, uh, there was a birth of a national consciousness, and it was being driven, but really by small uh, groups of people and sensibilities in the elite, uh, particularly, but also widely held and deeply held. Uh, and and what, what America did have was they had a hero. It had this hero who had uh, had been at the head of the army, and that was George Washington. And one of the great things Washington did, of course, that we all should be thankful for is he resigned his commission at the end of the war and went into retirement, as he called it, um, to Mount Vernon. And so not only did we have a hero, we had a hero that was emulating the ancient virtues of Cincinnati, this great Roman you know, senator who had saved the Republic and then retired to his plow. And that was sort of the context, the cultural context by which this first generation of independent Americans imagined who they were. What was distinctive about Americans? Well, one, one thing that was distinctive was that we had this ancient hero reborn, and then he lived at a place called Mount Vernon. So Mount Vernon, all of a sudden, becomes a famous place where you can you can see this person. And, uh, and so the essay really just explores uh, what that meant in the 1780s. And what I, what I come across believing after the research, I mean, and it's, it's a house, for instance, the only private house in North America that's featured in an almanac on the directions of how you get from here to here. It's it's everywhere in the newspapers. There's poems written about it. There's, there's people visiting there. And you got to remember, Chris, which I know you know, but uh, there is no real capital of the United States in the 1780s. There, 
you know, the, the, there's Trenton and there's Philadelphia and there's New York and there's various places that the Congress meets, but there's really no stable Capitol building. There's no stable sense of what is the national city. Um, and so Mount Vernon takes on this, this place of what I use, I talk about George Washington's court, and it's a, you know, a place of, of influence where you have uh, people writing histories and writing poetry and innovators and engineers and others. And so um, it's a way to kind of understand how national influence and identity worked at a time when there was, there was no national monuments, there was no national city, there was no unified commerce, but there were these stories you could tell and this place you could see. And I think that the takeaway that I came to come with is that the circle around George Washington, who were he was corresponding with and he was a part of, I mean, they are obviously the original Federalists. That's kind of well known. That means the original people who believed that the Articles of Confederation were inadequate to secure the long term independence of, of the nation. Um, you know, and I see them really as a center of opposition to the Articles. You know, it's sort of like in, in English politics where the uh where, where you know in the 18th century where the uh prince of wales and his court were opposition to the formal court of the king it's kind of like that i mean you you have really a circle of people i argue that they're the ones who coined the term anti-federalists and i also argue that they're the ones who originally define uh this period as a critical period that they're the ones who who fisk is quoting basically i mean they're the, the original fiskians they're proto fisks. Um, you know, they're, they're saying that you, you know this is a crisis. That everything's going to hell, and um, and they define an alternative. But they have that pessimism that's essential, obviously, when you're when you're defining something as a crisis. But they also have this optimism that they can shape. You know, they can change it and shape it and, and make it happen. And so, um, anyway, it's uh, it is an effort uh, to to describe this particular place at that moment and. I appreciate your kind words about it. Um, and so it's the, probably the most Fiskian of our essays. <laughs> well, no, I mean, if you, it, I don't know, if, I don't know if that's true either. Because we have a, a bunch of different perspectives in yeah. here. So I'm thinking um, we have two essays um, in this book. So we have seven all together, plus a really nice conclusion and an introduction. Yeah. Um, we have two essays in there that are on commerce and mm -hmm. finance, yeah. and and. And on you know, in the grand scheme of things, they're very different in what they argue. I mean, they're looking at two different things. So we have Dale Norwood's um, essay, "The Constitutional Crisis of Com uh, uh, of Commercial Crisis," mm -hmm. right? And um, he has, uh, and he starts off really nicely with these two ships uh, in the in the piece in this essay, uh, which I really like. And the juxtaposition of these two, you have one, the Empress of China. Um, which is setting sail on February 4th. It's a ship. The Empress of China is a ship for our audience. Yep. yep. Yeah, clear. And it's setting sail in, uh, in February 1784 for China to trade with China. And it is Yeah, the first celebrated. American to go to China. Really extraordinary. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, go and ahead. And it's celebrated with a 12-gun salute and poems and, you know, and all these people going out to see it. And on the same day, you have this other ship, the Edward, which is sailing to England with the um, uh, Treaty of Paris to finalize it all, and it's there's no pomp and parade. There's there's no celebration of this. And one of the things that um, that, that Dale points out is the reason for that is the treaty is um, some people are questioning the efficacy of the treaty because it doesn't have stipulations for commercial regulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, that's going to really hamper. The, the new country's ability to trade in Europe and the West Indies, which is the bread and butter. That was their economy. Exactly. So, and, and the way he shows us is that, well, for those interested in international commerce and Americans' financial future and sovereign authority through that, um, it is a crisis, mm -hmm. right? It is a crisis along a sort of, of That's right. yeah. or Fiskian sense. Yeah, right. but yeah, it's a problem that needs to be solved, and the Constitution helps resolve it because you create a a national power that can negotiate treaties, and you know, it's not an immediate turnaround. But but yeah, oh, oh. You know, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I think that the other essay, uh, you know, with deals from finance is Hannah's 
and of all this work, really innovative thinking about the the, the problem of money yep. and uh, and the balance of payments and how you uh, how you sustain your war effort and your your new states that are up to all this these things uh, and really uh, rejecting a formulation that of the fist formulation which Robert Morris is this heroic figure and then these paper money enthusiasts in the states are these evil you know immoral dangerous uh, radicals. And also sort of uh, rejecting the idea that the paper money enthusiasts are, uh, you know, are the, the heroes of the working man as well. You know, and, uh, it, you know and, and really looking at the practical ways that they are trying to solve these problems of, of finance in, in economies that are underdeveloped and, and in the midst of um, all kinds of challenges. Well, yeah, and what I really like about it is, and if you're thinking about it from a teaching perspective, or just want a new perspective on uh, finance after the after the Revolutionary War, I mean, they, they, there is a financial problem uh, uh, after the war, and uh, one of the things Fisk argues in the critical period is that, you know. Morris is heroic because he's creating something from nothing. Like, look what right. he's done to fund the war. And this is the title of her of her essay, Something from Nothing, question mark. Right? Is yeah. it really? Um, and then you have the paper money people um, that yeah. Fisk says are ludicrous and because they're creating something from nothing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and then from that point in the historiography, people have latched on to either of those um, to fit the particular narrative of what the 1780s is is it critical or yeah. not and who's at fault and etc and so what she does a really great job at is is showing that neither of those things are something from nothing mm -hmm. we need to take a step back and take away the sort of like the rhetoric used even at the time against either of those two they both were rooted in tangible things and and in a tangible past right and so Money is bad. Paper money is backed by land and taxes. And then on the other side of that, Morris is, is backed on account books and on international connections and on ways that merchants had tried to fix um, the finances of the colonial period into the revolutionary era. So it's just it's a it's a really fantastic essay that uh, explains a complex problem in a really easily digestible way. I well, I, I do think as we are in an age of uh, high inflation right now relative to what's been going on the last yeah. few odd years, uh, it, it's also even more relevant than it was when we wrote the introduction. Uh, oh, that's it. true, yes. Uh, yeah. Because the, that's the kind of uh, one of the contexts in which historians have judged both Morris yep. and the states in these uh, paper money admissions relative to hyperinflation caused by all sorts of currency issues and the war and then also you know how you're dealing with economies that are um, that have supply chain problems i mean you've exactly. got supply chain problems but yet you need to have circulating medium you need to have a value uh, that people can agree on and um, you yeah. know without all the sophisticated thinking we have today uh, you see these uh, early americans muddling through and, and really trying to solve problems uh in ways that are quite innovative and, 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 and using what they know, and as she called it, they're stable maintenance projects. I, I think that that's a, a good way of looking at them. Yeah, and I think that uh, we, we can round out the discussion before we, we talk a little about Johan's uh, consideration uh, with uh, Kevin Butterfield's piece, in which, again, this is definitely a lesson we should learn from. This is a piece about uh, people very worried about the creation of the Society of the Cincinnati. Uh, which was that honorary group that still exists today, of course. Uh, the Society of Cincinnati is a hereditary group of the officers of the Continental Army who came together at a time in New York when, you know, they basically had been unpaid for years and there was no bill passed through Congress to protect them. And there were all kinds of concerns of what would happen to them uh, when the treaty arrived because... <laughs> You don't need an army once you're at peace, and they were going to be demobilized. And so uh, the idea of Henry Knox and some other officers was that they could create this fraternal organization, which would you know, keep these bonds of friendship together that had been forged in war and sacrifice as they went back to their various states. And they created quite an elaborate association with the Constitution and all sorts of rules uh, to create the Society of the Cincinnati, which is where they would have an order of an eagle, they'd have honorary members, They'd have French members. They'd collect monies 
for the disbursement to widows and orphans, theoretically, and they might be involved in an advisory capacity as well. And this, the news of this by October already of 1783, uh, thanks to uh, Burke's essay, uh, it, 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 is, it is exactly the kind of hyperbolic uh, essay. I mean, Burke's essay would have been clickbait or a cable <laughs> news channel yeah. talking head. It would have been, I don't know, name your, name your partisan rag. It was, you know, the Society of Cincinnati is basically destroying the American Revolution. Right, but Butterfield shows us that mm, maybe that's not the case, right? No, no but he, I mean, right. he shows us how how real everybody took that. I mean, how yeah, how worried they were. I mean, history shows us that wasn't the case. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, that it was important for them to get over the idea that this was going to create an aristocracy. So by the time we get to the Constitution, that sort of threat had but, passed. Yeah. It. but it also helped the debate about it helped clarify what mm -hmm. Americans thought they'd create with the revolution. I mean, we can't take for granted now. Yeah, oh, true. the revolution got rid of a monarch, so therefore they're not going to have aristocrats and knights and lords. But, you know, there's no there's no European republic that didn't have titled nobility. Uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, no titles <coughs> or, or no entrenched uh, hereditary titled powerful church or uh, secular lords uh, doesn't exist anywhere in any complicated state. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a fantasy of ancient Greece in the, you know, in the 18th century, right? I mean, right. It's not until like what is it? 1792 that we have the naturalization law where we get rid of titles and nobility. It's 92, right? The fight over. Well, well title, yeah. I mean, that's official there, but this debate is happening right, earlier, right. and I, I'm like, yeah, and this debate over the society of Cincinnati is sort of helps people refine this notion of what 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 are we what have we created right uh you know and, and it, <coughs> it's interesting of course that it was a lot of hyperblown rhetoric as well yeah, yeah. Uh, overblown and that and that i think brings us you know as we're, as we're 50 minutes in it brings us to a good a good chance to talk about johan's conclusion so chris and i asked johan neem professor at western uh washington university bellingham to <coughs> To take a look at the essays and write an epilogue and tell us, you know, what you what what people should think and what we can think about it, and I thought it was a remarkable job to bring together these diverse essays in a way that spoke to him. What what's your takeaway, your elevator takeaway of what uh, what Johan has to say? Uh, my elevator takeaway is that, uh, that Johan saw our essays as a way to turn down the volume on this the sort of criticalness of the 1780s but also of, of the historiography that has existed and that um instead of the essays you walk away with an idea that the the founders however you define those and probably broadly um were tinkerers they were problem solvers they were trying to figure out their own time and place and they couldn't solve everything and didn't solve everything and that and one of the great things about Johann's piece is he does a great job with historiography, but beyond that is to see that those problems extend into the 1830s and 1840s. And so by decoupling, as it were, the Constitution from ours, our 1780s, um, you can actually see that continuity a bit better. That's yeah. what I yeah, that's that's. I think that's the historiographical takeaway. I think the presentist takeaway is uh, is also speaking to this question of our own day and age. And the and again, you know, maybe we don't need to uh, have such extreme, passionate uh, uh, fights about everything, but rather focus more on the practical. Turn down the volume on assuming that everything is the end all, be all. Uh, that this one bill is going to solve this crisis or this lack of action is going to destroy this whatever uh, and, and, and think about, you know, the, the, the long term. Uh, think about how to get through the moment um, together. It's an interesting takeaway that he, he puts on there. I like the optimism of it. Pearl, you're more cynical than I am, a grizzled old cynic that you are. It's, it's very true. But, but, you know, I, I, you know, we, of course, know each other from Binghamton University. And in Binghamton, they have that big rock sitting out in that field, which is something like, uh, you know, education, liberal arts education or history even is 
from breadth uh, to depth to perspective, right? Remember that written on that big yeah. rock? Yeah. And I've always said, you know, history provides perspective, and I think it should provide patience with our, our fellow uh, person. Uh, our, uh, our, our fellow mm -hmm. travelers on this on this tiny little globe flying through the universe. <laughs> now, who's the philosopher? <laughs> well, I didn't well, say I wasn't, but uh, Fisk and I, you know. <laughs> you know yeah. yeah, so this has uh, been an enjoyable conversation. I hope everybody has a wonderful Constitution Day. Read your Constitution with the amendments, remembering always that it was written and ratified and it was amended, and then it was amended again, and it's still being amended. And the possibilities are always there uh, to amend it. But it is now one of the longest-lasting written constitution uh, of, of a functioning government in the world. I think our system of government is really uh, maybe next to Great Britain, although I think there's been some quite radical changes to their system, uh, are the oldest uh, functioning representative uh, systems around. And, uh, and that this is, a, as George Washington called it, the last great experiment in human happiness under civil society. He meant the latest great experiment. Right. But let's hope it wasn't the last. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming as well and, and, and joining in with us and listening to us. This has been a great experience. Thank you very much to the National Archives. And thanks, Doug. Absolutely lovely to see you, Chris, again. And thank you, the National Archives. And we'll wrap it up there. Say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Buy the book. UVA oh, yes. Press. UVA Press. <laughs>